Uh, today, uh, I'm going to begin by reading a letter from the governor. Dear counselors, I'm pleased to nominate Whitney J. Brown to the position of Associate Justice of the Westboro District Court. I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Part 2, Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm enclosing the nominee's resume for your convenience. Sincerely, Charles D. Baker. Um, so, um, I'll first introduce the counselors and then we'll hear from the nominees' witnesses. So, we have Councillor Terry Kennedy with us today, Councillor Bob Juvenbill uh, joining us remotely, Councillor Chris Ionella, Councillor Eileen Duff, Councillor Mary Hurley, um, and Councillor Joe Ferreira. Uh, and so, with that, um, would you like to ask your first, was first witness to step up and join, or will we be going remote? To we have, I have two witnesses who are remote, so I, I would defer to whoever's doing that. Okay. Let's begin uh, uh, with Judge Haley. Judge Haley, are you ready to join us? Hello. Good morning. I am. Can you hear me? Uh, we okay. can hear you. It's a little quiet. Okay, um, I'll speak up then. Uh, thank you for providing me this opportunity to speak on behalf of Whitney's uh, nomination for the district court bench. Um, I've known Whitney for in excess, I think, of 15 years, both personally and professionally. Um, I know her to be hardworking. Uh, How's the audio sound in the room? Uh, knowledgeable in the law, and I believe she'll be a fine candidate for the district court. I can't think of any better training ground for a judge than to be a clerk magistrate uh, before they are nominated to the bench. In fact, that's my own background. And I can tell you from experience that you have a level of comfort uh, that most people wouldn't have just from having run a courtroom and sat facing the, the uh, audience as opposed to having them at your back as you uh, advocate for the clients. Um, the jurisdiction of the district court is so broad that I think it would be rare for any litigator to have experienced all of it. Just before today's meeting, I was uh, thumbing through Connors and Perlin's treatise on the civil jurisdiction of the court. That book has 26 chapters, runs to 600 pages, and it covers the myriad of different hearings that are conducted in the district court from dog appeals to firearm appeals, unemployment appeals, uh, marriage without delay, the list goes on and on and on. Only a, a long tenured judge, as Judge Hurley, I think, could probably tell you, or a long tenured clerk would have experienced all of those many different types of hearings. The criminal jurisdiction is similarly broad and nuanced. It's, um, we deal with everything, we, I guess, the district court, which I used to be a part of, deals with everything from minor misdemeanor motor vehicle charges to bind over cases of, of capital offenses. Uh, everything seems to start here in the district court. Whitney has spent much of the last 15 years in the courtroom, in my experience. Um, so she's observed not just myself, but a, a number of different judges. She's been able to observe different temperaments, different pacing in the courtroom. Um, and so she, she can take a little bit from each judge uh, as to what she thinks might she might want to have for her own persona. I know I did that myself. Um, the, at Yankee, the Yankee great Yogi Berra once said, you can observe <coughs> just by watching. And uh, I think that's true. I mean, you, she's been in the courtroom, she's seen it all. Um, she's seen a bunch of different people do the work. Um, I should add a caveat here. I'm not a Yankees fan. But uh, Mrs. Brown is from New Jersey originally, and whether or not she is a Yankees fan may be a legitimate area of inquiry for the council. Um, to those of us who work, who have worked in the district court or have worked in the district court, the highest praise you can give another member of the of the team is to say they get it. Whitney gets it. She understands that everybody that comes before the court is in distress of one sort or another. She understands that all of those people entitled to be treated fairly and with respect. And she understands that the exchanges between a judge and counsel in the courtroom don't occur on a, a level playing field. 
and that a judge has to take care um, not to undercut or embarrass counsel as they make their arguments uh, before the court. Uh, on more than one occasion, I've come out of the courtroom and, and Whitney or one of the other clerks has said to me, the lawyers want to know why you're in a bad mood. And I'd go, I'm not in a bad mood. And it's, it's such a slight thing to the person on the bench, but being aware of it, you can take care not to, uh, not to put a counsel in a difficult spot with their clients. And she understands too how hard it is to practice law and the, the, the demands of private counsel's uh, schedules so that sometimes you can be there in time, sometimes you can't. It's the nature of the beast. I think it was Benjamin Desraeli who said, the secret to success is being ready when your opportunity arrives. In my view, Whitney's ready. Um, if you approve her nomination, I'm sure she'll find great success on the bench and serve with great distinction. I would encourage you to act favorably on her nomination for a number of reasons. One of them is that my guess is that once this COVID uh, matter is put to rest, the courts are gonna be tremendously busy. With Whitney's vast experience, she'll be ready to hit the ground running. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you very much, Judge Haley. Uh, and I'll open it to any counselors who may have questions for you. Mr. Chair, any of the remote I don't counselors? Have a question. Mary Hurley. Um, I just want to say hi to Judge Haley. We served together. Um, he was a model for uh, appropriate demeanor and temperament, and uh, it was a pleasure to hear from you again. Good I see it. Thank you. I think you might be mistaking me for someone else. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Any other counselors on the remote call? Well, thank you, Judge Haley, for being here. You dropped implications of the nominee's Yankee fandom, and yet you had many marvelous things to say. So I think that speaks well uh, to this nominee. Thank An you exception for to my Yankee hating rule for Mrs. Brown. Thank and that's you a powerful, all. It's a powerful all statement right. for being here this morning. Okay, and uh, is Clerk Magistrate Maldonado remote as well? I am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Council Members. Good morning. Thank you, for the, thank you for the opportunity to address you today regarding the judicial appointment of Clerk Magistrate Whitney Brown. I apologize in advance if I'm difficult to understand. I had some surgery last week, so my ability to speak clearly is not up to par. Um, I have worked along uh, shoulder to shoulder with Mrs. Brown for almost the past 16 years. And I believe that puts me in an excellent position to evaluate her ability and character. Clerk Magistrate Brown was appointed to the Gardner District Court in 2005 after serving as the first Assistant Clerk Magistrate of the Middlesex Superior Court. As often the case, there were some concerns regarding the appointment of an outsider. It didn't take long for those concerns to diminish. Ms. Brown made a seamless transition into her new role. Her professional demeanor embodied her commitment to this position as well as to the community. She quickly gained the respect of the local bar and the district attorney's office. Ms. Brown intera enjoys interacting with the public and has the ability to bring a situation from 100 to zero in a matter of seconds with her calm demeanor, genuine concern, knowledge, and ability to make pe people feel that they are being heard. It is a rare occasion that she will pass by the clerk's office, by the counter in the clerk's office without inquiring if someone needs assistance. Ms. Brown has gained the respect of the staff in the clerk's office by having an open door policy. Employees feel comfortable approaching her with whatever concerns or questions that they may have and know that the outcome may, even though the outcome may not be in their favor, that they were able to be heard and understood. She has the ability to mo motivate others to achieve their highest potential in the workplace and will stand behind each one of them. Ms. Brown is a woman of solid integrity and genuine compassion. She is very conscientious and capable in the performance of her duties. She constantly displays a demeanor and temperament that is calm, pleasant, courteous, and respectful. She is well-versed and knowledgeable about the law, the legal process, and the district court practices and procedures. 
She's a disciplined, reasonable, and patient individual with a temperament suited for judicial office. To share the impact that she has had on the community yeah. in our area, um, she and I were at lunch one day and a defendant approached the table to thank her. He stated that having been before her in a clerk's hearing made him feel as though he had been heard and she had given him the opportunity to redeem himself when he was at a particularly low point in his life. I myself have the privilege of not only being able to call her my boss, but also my friend. Whitney is a woman of great character. She is empathetic, respectful, and loyal. She is trustworthy, thoughtful, and has a great sense of humor. Having become her friend has also allowed me to become close with her family members, including her wife, Betsy, children, Addison, Cole, and Spencer, along with her mom, Carol. They have raised, um, sorry, Whitney and Betsy have instilled the true meaning of love within their family. They have raised exceptionally bright, outgoing and caring young adults that all share a genuine respect for one another. I feel confident that my 36 years experience working for the trial court adds to my ability to assess this candidate. While I am happy to endorse her candidacy, I will miss my friend. The daily laughs we shared, the comfort in knowing that I always had someone to talk to, work related or personal, and the fact that there was always someone there who had my back. I would be remiss if I didn't state that this would be an application that would lead you to no regrets and ask that you ask favorably, act favorably. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and we'll open it up to any counselors who have questions for you. Any counselors remote have questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. For your well, thank you very much for being here this morning. Wish you a fast recovery and um, we appreciate uh, you sharing your perspective on the nominee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, we have a witness who is with us today, uh, attorney Max Berwick. Good morning, Attorney Berwick. Good morning, council members. Thank you for your time. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Whitney Brown for approximately 10 years during her time as clerk magistrate in the Gardner Winston District Courts. And during which time I've been a practicing attorney in those courts. Um, I can tell the, the council members that I believe Whitney would be an excellent addition to the ranks of district court judges in Massachusetts. I found her to be courteous, respectful, and just in her rulings and her role as the clerk magistrate. Um, the Gardner Winston District Courts, like many in the Commonwealth, are courts that handle a number of small, close knit communities. And as such, we see a lot of the same individuals in and out of those courts on a daily basis, whether it's repeat defendants, parties to civil cases or to restraining orders, harassment orders. And regardless of the individual's history of transgressions in front of the court or what brings them to court on any given day, I've seen Clerk Magistrate Brown treat them all with dignity and respect, and I've very much admired that. Um, similarly, when individuals have been in those courts suffering from physical or mental health disabilities, I've seen Whitney extend those individuals every possible accommodation of the court to make sure they have a favorable experience and they're treated equally. And I, again, very much admire that. Um, what I've also really grown to admire her, her willingness to give individuals second chances. I think that's probably the most important role of a district court judge. Um, whether it be in default removal hearings, in pre-charge clerk magistrate hearings, in bail hearings, I think she's, I've always known her to listen with an open ear and attentive ear and to really give individuals a second chance whenever deserved, um, regardless of their history in front of the court. Um, I think, again, she's someone, although the clerk magistrate's role always involves a number of day-to-day -day tasks, whether it be keeping an accurate record, organizing the next case to be called, and whether or not it's an issue she's required to rule on, whenever attorneys in her court are making arguments, I've known her to really have her head up, be focused, be attentive, and really digest everything that's being said in court. And that's always struck me as a real desire on her part to be constantly learning. And I think that's going to greatly aid her as a district court. Finally, I think one thing that I really wanted to mention to the council is that, you know, the majority of my interactions with Whitney over the years have been inside the courtroom in a professional sense. But despite that, over the past year during the COVID pandemic, 
there's been a couple occasions when she reached out just to, to express to me her appreciation for my work for the court and just to check in and make sure that I'm doing all right. And although it was, you know, it's minor gestures, it didn't take much time, they did really mean a lot to me. And I think that her actions probably mean similarly as much to everyone she's worked with, all the people that appear in front of her in the court as a clerk magistrate, and certainly everyone that would appear in front of her in the future as a district court judge. I really couldn't endorse her more. I think she would be an excellent addition to the, to the job, and I would encourage the council to act favorably upon her application. Thank you, Attorney Berwick. Um, are there any questions from the council for the witness? Um, is council Manny Manny and, then... and, Rich, and this is Richard. And this is Alyssa. Is someone else talking? Let's let's hear from Councillor Devaney, Councillor Juvenville, and then um, <laughs> I'm not sure who is talking remotely, but we'll. Thank you for coming. I always like to see someone eye to eye. Um, tell me, um, how long have you worked with uh, Whitney Brown? Approximately 10 years. Really? Wow. So uh, what would you say is her greatest attribute that she's going to bring to the bench? I really think it's her, a combination of her compassion and how she treats individuals in the court. Um, regardless of someone's demeanor inside the courtroom. I mean, she's certainly no pushover if people are being disrespectful, yeah. but she treats everyone with courtesy and fairly. She doesn't let personal things step in the way of her role of being a fair and impartial clerk magistrate. And I think as a district court judge, that's going to be it. So do you, do you work with her on a day-to-day -day basis or? I would say over the past 10 years, I've been in Gardner District Court, probably an average of two to three times a week. Wow. There are a few, you know, in-session clerk magistrates, but I'd say about a third of those days have been with Whitney. So, so you really know her temperament that, you know, when she's under stress or, or all of that. So how would you rate that? Well, I would say that really what I've learned most about when she is or isn't under stress comes from personal conversations. I, I would never think that I would know that from observing her in the courtroom. She has an even temperament and she treats people fairly. And really what I've learned about what, you know, rubs her the wrong way would be from, you know, personal conversations. You would never take that from her in court experience. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for coming. I, I appreciate you coming in. Thank you for having me. Councilor Juvenile. Thank you. Um, how long have you been practicing? Um, since 2007. And you mentioned, uh, oh. That you see the same people a lot of times coming through the courts. So I've always wondered about that. And I always wonder why. If you went through that system once. Why you would ever want to go through it again. Why do you think they do? That's a very good question. And I think my honest answer is I don't think they want to do that. I think a lot of people have difficulties getting out of their own way, whether it be financial difficulties, mental health disabilities. Um, and I think what I was mentioning is also just not individuals necessarily appearing repeatedly as criminal defendants, but as party of civil orders. And I think once you get yourself in some criminal trouble, sometimes people end up in, in circles of individuals where problems create themselves. But I do think one thing I admire about the Gardner Court is that a lot of individuals, regardless of that cycle, do manage to get themselves out of that cycle and move forward with, you know, successful lives. And I think a lot of that is the credit to the court. The court system treats civilians. I, yeah, I think I've come to the conclusion that um, people can't help it. But we just keep recycling them through. I would agree. Uh, what are they doing in the um, Gardner court and the, is, is Winchington still opened officially? It is. They're combined into one building, but they they operate somewhat separately in the clerk's office. But they're all. What happened to the old building up in Wint? I'm not positive. I believe maybe it was a lease issue. I think it was somewhat of a smaller courthouse, and I think it may have made. Yeah. That's to combine it to one. Well, thank you for your testimony. It means a lot to me. Thank, thank you. you. And, I'm not sure which of the remote counselors had questions, but please. Or are there none? We're all set. I okay. have none. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. I don't have any either. Thank I'm you. I want to this council meeting right thank now. You, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Attorney Berwick, thank you for being here today. I think it's great to hear from a practicing an attorney and a bar advocate who's worked with the nominee, and it speaks perhaps to her fitness for a district court position. Thank you. Um, so thanks for coming out to Boston today. Pleasure. Thank you, Joe.
Uh, I'll first ask if there's anyone here to speak in opposition of this nominee. And there being none, um, perhaps um, before we hear your statement, um, you'd like to introduce uh, your family who's here with you today. All right, thank you, Councillor. I'm so happy and so pleased to have my family with me here this morning. Um, I'd like to first introduce my wife, Betsy. And I also have with me one of my twins, my son, Timothy Cole, and also my daughter, Addison. Um, unfortunately, my uh, daughter, Spencer, who is Cole's twin, is unable to travel because of the COVID restrictions um, from her university. Um, Addison is joining me and has given up a day of law school. She's a second year law student. And um, Tim will be starting college in the fall because of the pandemic. He deferred his enrollment. So uh, I, I want to acknowledge and thank them because I wouldn't be sitting here today without the love and support and have been me, with me every step of the way through this process. And I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have them with me today, even though like is still ongoing. We're glad you were able to have them here with you today. Um, so. I understand you have a statement prepared and I do feel counselor. free. Thank you. Well, I want to start by saying that I am absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to be before you this morning. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity also, in addition to my, my beautiful family, um, to thank some other people who have been with me along this journey or, or aided me in getting here today. And I think when they say it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to get to the position I'm here today. So many people who have been supportive of me along this journey. I want to thank Valerie McCarthy, who, with all the logistics leading up to today and my my remote witnesses, has been instrumental. I want to thank Lauren Green Petrino and Bob Ross for their professionalism and their support throughout this process and their guidance. I want to thank Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito for having the confidence to nominate me for this position. And I want to assure them and you, if I do get the privilege of representing, of uh, serving the people of this Commonwealth in this position, that I will do everything in my power to assure that this council and this administration can look back on my appointment with pride. In addition, I'd like to thank my family, my extended family in New Jersey, who couldn't be with me today, who I know, like my daughter Spencer, I'm sure are watching, my mother, my brother Tim and his wife Susan, my niece and nephew Katie and Harry, my brother Pat. Again, but for COVID, they'd be here today, but I'm unable to have that. Um, I guess what I'd like to, to do is tell you a little bit about myself as you contemplate my nomination today. I was born and grew up in New Jersey. I am the oldest of three children and the only daughter of Whitney and Carol Brown. As I discussed with Councilor Drubenville this morning, yes, I was named after my father. Um, my parents married soon after high school and started a family. My father was a teamster and drove a truck for a living. My mother, when she went back to work after my brothers and I were uh, in school, she was a bookkeeper. Um, neither of my parents had the opportunity to attend college, but I can tell you that um, the importance of education was ever present in our home, and they encouraged us to educate ourselves. After high school, I went on to college. I attended college on a four-year athletic scholarship for basketball, and after college, I went right to law school. In order to pay my law school tuition, my mother took on a second job as a clerk in a pharmacy and my father painted houses on the weekends. Um, it was always my father's wish that I would become a lawyer. And it's something he talked about with me since as far back as I could remember. And I lost my father 17 years ago on this very day. So when Councillor DePaulo suggested the date and my hearing fell on his anniversary. I knew that it was more than just a coincidence. 
Um, after law school, I began practicing law in Malden. Uh, that firm focused on real estate, banking, and estate work. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to do some pro bono work. I appeared in the district court, the probate court, and the superior court. I was appointed as a GAL out of the probate court. I sat on medical malpractice tribunals in the Superior Court. In 1993, I left that position to accept appointment as the first assistant clerk at the Middlesex Superior Court. And I served in that position for 13 years. I left there in 2005 when I was nominated as the clerk magistrate of the Gardner District Court. And then in 2011, the Chief Justice of the District Court appointed me as the acting clerk of the Winchington District Court. And I've held these positions for the past 16 years. So I come before you today with 31 years of legal experience and 28 years of experience in the trial court. And during these years, I have worked with many judges, many attorneys, many pro se litigants, and I've spent literally thousands of hours in a courtroom. And during those hours, I've conducted small claims trials, um, show cause hearings, probation detention hearings, bail hearings, civil case management conferences, and motor vehicle appeals. In addition, it's always been my practice to work at the front counter in the clerk's office, to pick up the telephone and to answer calls, to make myself available not only to my staff, but to the attorneys, to the litigants, to the families, and to the public, which I think is extremely important because those are served. I cannot imagine a better way to have prepared myself for this moment. I would be humbled and delighted to serve the Commonwealth in this new and exciting matter as an Associate Justice of the District Court. And I would hope that you find me qualified to do that. So I thank you for your time and your consideration on my nomination. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna open it to questions from counselors and we're gonna start um, first with Councillor Duff. Hello, I appreciate it. Um, it's nice to see you, Attorney Brown. Um, I don't have a lot of questions. I was very uh, excited about this nomination. You have great re references, many of whom have reached out to me and some unexpected as well. Um, but I did want to um, go over with you a couple of things we had talked about. Um, one of the groups of folks um, that I'm concerned about, and I know that you've had some experience as a clerk magistrate, um, or when people come into the district court um, and they have any kind of uh, different ability or disability, be, be that um, a physical or a cognitive, um, I, I get concerned about people um, that we may not always recognize something that could have um, a negative impact on them if, if it's not considered. Uh, I hope I'm making sense saying this. Can you share any um, ideas or experience or thoughts you've had working perhaps with people who might be on the spectrum, um, autism, Asperger's, or any of the multitudes of uh, issues like that? Um, thank you, Counselor. Um, I have worked with young people a lot in, in, you may have seen in my application in terms of with schools and in, in doing show cause hearings, many times the population that you see in that are young people. But overall, yes, I've had some experience dealing with people who have had physical or mental um, challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important for a court to realize that as early in the process as possible, because I think it's our job, especially a district court ju judge's job, to make sure that this process is understandable to every individual who comes before the court. And we have to amend and alter the way we handle that proceeding to make sure that happens. Um, whether that to be to slow down the proceeding, to appoint counsel, to assist that individual step the matter back so they can have things explained to them. Um, it's important that everybody get treated with respect and everybody understand what's happening while they're in the courtroom. Yeah. Um, in addition, I think there's even physical challenges. In Gardner, we have one attorney um, who's in a wheelchair. And I remember just seeing him struggling to get in and out of the courtroom door, to get into the door for probation. And 
ours is an older courtroom, so it really wasn't handicap accessible. And I went to the capital department of the uh, trial court and had them change out some of the um, door hinges and things that would make the doors open easier for him and asked if we could install some sort of automatic doors and change the tension on the doors so that he could get in and out with less struggle. And although it wasn't a big deal for us, I'm sure it was a big deal to him. Because it's another complicating factor with, you know, that he was trying to get through today. So I think there's so many different um, people who come before the court and we need to be cognizant of what their needs are so to make their experience as fair uh, as as the next person who comes into court. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you for your thoughts and, and for your action on that. Um, you know, like I've said before, when someone with any type of cognitive disability, particularly uh, commits a crime, it doesn't absolve them of the crime. It may mean that they don't quite understand things the same way we do, but we do need to make sure that, that we are uh, making sure they're safe. But for what you added um, about helping that attorney who was in a chair, I deeply appreciate that. You know, we're talking about building diversity uh, in the courts and on the bench and uh, making courts accessible for lawyers with all different abilities is really important. And I don't know that we've um, been as cognizant and aware as we could be. So thank you for that. And um, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman DiPaolo. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, Councillor Jubenbill, would you like to go next? I would, thank you. Um, the issue of uh, COVID, which has impacted our courts, and now they're talking about starting to open it up a bit. What is the latest you've heard as far as district court trials happening again? Well, the Supreme Judicial Court just issued another standing order and the district court order, I think it's 1319, came out effective March 1st um, and March 5th. We were supposed to start resuming jury trials, phase two of the overall plan. I know Chief Justice Kerry recently sent an update saying that we have leased four spaces in four different counties um, and two additional counties to be added soon. Um, we're going to try to get jury trials up and running. The plan is for one jury trial in each of those locations. And then once that gets underway to add maybe two or three, we're starting with criminal cases where people have been in custody, which I think appropriate place to start. Um, and then as we move forward, I think we're going to try and pick up a speed as quickly, but as safely as we can. So right now we're at phase two and the resumption of if any have actually taken place as of yet, but uh, the trial court is working very hard. Cognizant of the burden that it's placed on, you know, the, the public not being able to move forward with trials because although we have thousands of cases, to those individuals, many of them, it's their only case and their whole life revolves around that. So to have it put on pause for such a long time and to carry that burden and that stress for a long time, I think it's taken its toll. I think the administration, the SJC, Justice Kerry and the district court probably are doing their best to get those trials up and running. One thing, one thing I don't see in the orders or the discussion is issue of uh, wearing masks during a trial. Your position on that? Well, I think, you know, we have to defer to the state and the CDC in terms of safety, and we have to be very cognizant of how people feel we're you know we're summonsing them in we're asking them to come in and participate in these trials and i think we have to provide as safe an environment as possible um, i think with social distancing ideally it would be nice if the masks could be removed so for clarity in terms of being able to understand what people are saying um, and just so that it, it gives some normalcy to the proceeding but at the same time i think safety has to be paramount so I think that would be, you know, a call for 
you know, someone more, you know, in terms of a health professional than necessarily the court, I think. The thing that concerns me is on the criminal side of the court. You as a judge or lawyer or prosecutor or the jury, how do you how do you determine they're a witness credible or not when they wear a face mask? I think that's uh, a valid point. You know, um, we have over thousands of years as humans developed the technique of looking at people's faces, determine reactions and to decide whether or not we feel a threat or we think somebody is not credible with us. We've learned that through our lives. I'm sure you as a clerk and whether you were sitting in a courtroom as a clerk or whether you were doing clerk's hearings, get a sense of whether somebody is telling you the truth or not by the way they look and act with their facial features. So, to me, I'm all for safety, but not at the expense of taking away somebody's ability to have a fair trial. I think having a fair trial, one of the, one of the uh, things about having a fair trial is to be able to see the witnesses testifying. And equally as important to me probably the prosecutor was a judge able to look at jurors, see their reaction to certain things that go on in the courtroom or to see whether or not they're paying attention, concerned about certain issues. So we read a lot in faces in a courtroom. Jury's always looking at a defendant or reactions. Or, or lawyers, get jurors to see their reactions. To go down a certain area and I'm questioning. Uh, so, um, I guess my question is, you're sitting as a judge. Um, I have a case in front of you and I, you know, set to go to trial. They, to people wearing masks when they're on the stand or jurors. What's going to be your reaction? Well, I think your points are well taken and extremely valid, and I share those concerns. Yeah, but what I, you can, what's going to be your ruling? Well, I, I, I think that you're right. That needs to be addressed. And I think that the burden would be on the trial court to create a space that is safe where people can remove their masks because I think we're balancing that with also you don't want jurors who are afraid or apprehensive who are worried about their health and safety not really pay attention paying attention to the proceeding um, because that's not fair to the defendant either um, if they just want the trial to be over they want to get it bring it to conclusion because they're concerned that they're in this space um, so I think we need to balance that and so I, I think I would do my best to balance it and make it fair for the jurors so they can be relaxed and, and participate fully in the trial. And you're right, as, uh, also allow the defense attorneys, the prosecution, the defendant, the judge also to see the reaction of the individual. I think that's extremely important. Oh, they seem to have in these courtrooms a lot of plexiglass witness stand, have it around the jurors, certainly protects them from airborne viruses. I know some judges have said to me that they add up to a decision based on the prosecutor and the lawyer. If you two guys agree or two women agree to forward with the masks, fine. If you don't, then Give you a new date because at some point down the road hopefully we will not be wearing masks 
not in the way we do now. Me, unless somebody is incarcerated and kind of issues. I, why not continue matters? I mean, yeah, we're going to have a big backlog, but we'll get to it. We've had big backlogs in the court system before, and we've worked through them. So I, I, I just don't think enough is being given to that, that issue. For a trial, that is extremely important. Prosecutors and I have discussed that. said, yeah, very important to them, too, in the courtroom. But you as the fact finder. Extremely important to how do how do jurors get a reaction from some witness with a mask on? Sometimes you look at a witness testifying and you look over at the jurors and you can say they're not believing the guy or the woman. That's all taken out of the equation right now. Well, I, I agree and, and I have many times been able to tell by someone's demeanor and their expression, whether it be in a show cause hearing or other, whether or not I find them credible or I believe what they're telling me. Um, we haven't had to deal with that as much in those circumstances because everything now is being done by Zoom, you know, and I haven't turned the camera on, so I still have the ability, but you're absolutely right. If we're going to bring, bring people back and do in-person trials, that is a very important court is going to have to grapple with. Well, the issue with Zoom also, it's fine in my view for certain things. But as far as having trial with witnesses on Zoom, or I've been at hearings where I can see the witness looking down at his police report as he's speaking on the Zoom. Well, he's looking down. Assuming it's a police report, because after he looks, he says something that appears that it probably is in the police report. And that's not allowed if you're on the stand. Also been in, in Zooms where uh, assistant DA was looking at the screen, but constantly looking above after each question or topic that came up. Clearly indicating to me there was somebody on the other side of the camera giving them either some sort of signal or whiteboarding or whatever. So I think that isn't fair either and shouldn't be allowed. I don't know how we stop that, but so I think Zooms are okay for some issues, some court appearances like pre-trials and things like that. But as far as a trial or a, or a hearing, I, I, would, you, would you force a trial on a Zoom? No, I don't think I would. I agree with you. When we use Zoom, it is appropriate in some instances, not in all, and there is a loss of control because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So I think, you know, we're doing the best that we can under these circumstances, but I agree we shouldn't rush everything forward for the sake of time if we can't do it appropriately. Right. I think that's more important. So I... I uh, the other... Pet issue I have is, um, did you ever see the uh, pretrial conference forms? Well, of course, yeah. Uh, on the back of it, little area that asks you whether or not you're going to have a jury trial or a jury wave trial. It asks you to check a box. Some forms I've seen in parentheses, a uh, colloquy to be given when you sign that like box. Uh, so how does how does a uh, defendant select a jury or jury way trial without knowing the judge? Well, I, I think that question is multifaceted in the sense that um, in theory, everybody should be getting the same form of justice, every judge that they sit before, fair, impartial, and we shouldn't be able to dictate an outcome of a case just by who's sitting on the bench. It should be determined by the facts of that case. 
but I understand what you're where you're getting at the apprehension of a defendant making those choices. Factors unknown. I think even in in the context of where we are with the pandemic now making that choice may be that you're going to have your trial in a month or you may have your trial in a year or two. So, I think for a defendant to make that choice with so many factors is difficult. Well, I agree with you that. You know, you want justice to be equal. Whatever that is. I don't know what justice is anymore. Here. Depending on the outcome of a trial, one side said one side said they get justice. The other side said they didn't. So I don't know what that term means anymore, but that aside. Uh, you know, the, if every judge was the same, I would agree a hundred percent with you, but they're not. Fortunately, there are judges that I know, and you may know, that have never said the word not in front of guilty in their entire career. So that is not somebody that, if I was a lawyer, I would elect to go jury waived with. And the reason judges, I mean, the reason lawyers and clients decide that issue is based on the judge. Because as you probably know, us lawyers sit around courthouses and we talk about judges. Clerks too. Well, clerks more important than judges. <laughs> but we talk about judges. I get a handle on them if we don't know their history. And if a local lawyer, if your witness said to me, I wouldn't go jury way with that judge. That's a pretty good indication to me that I shouldn't do it either. People say, well, that's judge shopping. I disagree. It's not judge shopping at all. When I sign that document at a pretrial and get a date a month or two down the road, I don't know who's going to be sitting that day. When I show up for a trial in the district court, I don't know who's sitting in courtroom one or courtroom two that day. There may be a schedule that somebody showed me, but I don't know whether the judge that was supposed to be there had to take a sick day or couldn't or get put into another court that day or is in another session, not the trial session. So to me, judge shopping is if I get to a courthouse and I'm in courtroom one, and I don't like that judge in the professional sense, but I like the judge in courtroom too. If somehow I can arrange to have that file taken from one courtroom and put into another, I'd say that's judge shopping. But that's few and far between that somebody, number one, can get to do that without alerting some people as to what you're doing. So. You know, I, I take my, when, when that question on the back of that pretrial conference form asks whether or not you're going to pick a jury or non-jury, I write in, I cannot make the decision at this time. And only one judge has said something to me about it. And I said to him the same thing I'm going to say to you. And the same thing I'd say to you if you were on the bench and I was before you. Five Supreme Judicial Court judges in this Commonwealth at a public hearing stated that it would be ineffective assistance of counsel and malpractice to waive that right without knowing the judge that you are going before. So I wouldn't want to be incompetent or commit malpractice. And I'm sure you as a judge wouldn't want me to do that either. Absolutely not, counsel. Uh, but um, in some counties, they they take that and they want to have the client give up that right right there 
without knowing. He comes back, the judge. You, as you, if you're sitting on the bench, would you would you make a client give up that right before? Knowing? I would not. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't. I don't have anything else. I. Th I think you're well qualified. Um, I think you're going to make a wonderful judge. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Devaney. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Uh, I appreciate all the time that you afforded me. Uh, I think it was four hours, but I um, got to know you as a person rather than just these papers. And that's very important to me, and that's why I meet with everyone. And um, I, I just want to say that, boy, you were right up to the mark. You, uh, you have 18 months in this process to be appointed. And um, you, you filled your application out November 2019. 16 months now. Congratulations. Thank you, you so did much. <laughs> um, now, um, I always like to ask the nominee to, um, you know, to tell us the journey coming here. I know it's 16 months. I know that. I know you applied eight years ago for two district courts and were rejected. And um, that would be Governor Patrick? Could be? Correct. So you were approved by the then JNC both times yes. and rejected by the governor. So thank you for reapplying. Because sometimes I know I talk to lawyers and they don't reapply because they saw someone that got the job really wasn't that qualified. So that's the thing. I really appreciate when people reapply. Okay, so let's go back to um, your most recent uh, JNC uh, interview. When was that? Um, July 21st of July 21st. Okay, so um, for the public, there are 21 JNC, Judicial Nominating Commission members. These are 21 lawyers that the governor has appointed with the most awesome responsibility to decide who they are going to interview for a clerk magistrate or for a judge position. And um, as I've said, they have more they have more authority than any of us. We're not even told how many apply. I don't expect to know who applies, but I'd like to know how many, but that's a secret. So what I'm saying is that um, there should be 21 people that interview you and every nominee for clerk magistrate and for a judge. And there was, I've been here a long time, 21 years, and I remember years ago, there was a JNC chair, and he told those 21 lawyers who had this responsibility, if you don't go to the hearing of that nominee, you don't vote on the nominee. But guess what? With this JNC and this administration, there never has been 21 at any hearing, and yet they all vote, never see the person, never heard, never talked. So there's nothing to do with you. You did it, and, and you were well qualified to get through it. But I want the public to know, they think that we have so much authority. Believe me, we don't. The authority we have is to give our advice and consent to, to vote yes or no, and that's it. So you can see why it was so important for me to meet with you. And, and it was really a delight. I thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so uh, now, having said that, how many of the 21 were at the hearing? Well, I don't know how much COVID impacted my hearing um, because I got the letter in March saying I was going to get an interview. But then, as we know, COVID hit and things were shut down. So that interview didn't take place until the third week. Yeah, Zoom July. has taken over. I know. Yeah. Right. So when I was there, um, the chairman of the JNC was there, 
um, and everyone else appeared via Zoom. All everyone, how many? I believe there were 11 or 12. Yeah, 11 or 12. Here's my point. Nine people will vote for you. I can't, I wouldn't do that in my position here. To vote for someone I never talked to, never seen, the whole thing. But anyway, you know what? I live by the serenity prayer. I try to accept the things I can't change. But anyway, so um, congratulations. And um, I'm delighted. 31 years. 31 years. We don't always see that. And for me, that's very important. And it's not only for my position to vote for someone to be a judge, but it tells it, you, I asked myself the question, does this person have life experience? Someone 40 doesn't have the life experience to be on the court. I know there has been exceptions in the past, but I think really um, you bring that all. And uh, you've done a lot in your life. You've been very involved in your community and Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts and everything. And I'm impressed with that. So, um, okay, so let's get to um, your experience. You worked, you worked in a firm. Tell me, how did you make that decision? How did that come up that you would go into a clerk magistrate assistant position? Well, back in the day, um, the trial court used to have what they were called 90 day appointments. So while I was waiting for my bar results, I, I did a 90 day like internship or position at the Middlesex Superior. Got a taste for the court and I loved it. But soon after that, I applied for and I took a position at the firm. But in the back of my head, I always thought about that experience that I had with the court and I enjoyed it. And in 1993, or probably advertised in 1992, the Middlesex Superior Court was filling the position of the first assistant clerk. And so I applied for that and I was very fortunate to receive that appointment. Um, I worked with Eddie Sullivan, who was then the clerk of courts and been the clerk of courts for 42 years. He was the best. The best. Um, and I would say that's where I really learned the meaning of being a true public servant. If anybody knew Eddie Sullivan, they would know he yeah. was a true yeah, no. public servant and he would remind us regularly that the public, they're the ones who pay our salaries and we are there to serve them. And I think one of the things I've carried with me from working with uh, Mr. Sullivan is that when I got to Gardner and they were installing a phone system, you know, I hate automated calling. I hate when you have to push a lot of buttons and when people are calling. Excuse me, that's all we're having now. People are on the phone for hours trying to get through an agency. You know? Exactly. And I think when the people are trying to get the get through to the court, they're usually distressed in some way. You're not calling just a chit chat with us. You know, you have a reason why you're calling. So although I wasn't unable to have my way that there would be no automation, I did insist that my phone system be set up that after you have the initial recording, you push one button, any button, and you get a live person. Wow. Because I wanted people to be able to speak to someone and help direct them in the, in the right way. I didn't want to have to listen to directions and every department name and all the rest of it. I wanted us to serve the public and be available to them person to person. Great. Can you tell us anything else that you, um, what other innovation that you established since you've been in the court? Well, in Gardner, you know, we were freestanding court and then in, um, maybe it was 2007 that the Winchenden District Court closed and they were physically moved into our building. At that time, there was a clerk magistrate for the Winchenden Court and he came with his staff. Um, in 2011, he retired, and I was appointing the act, appointed the acting clerk. And what I found frustrating is that we were operating two courts out of one building and operating as two separate courts. So lawyers would come in, say, on a Tuesday to handle their Gardner case, and then they'd come in on a Wednesday to handle their one Winchenden case. And so it didn't make sense to me. It was a lot of wasted time. These lawyers are trying to make a living. They're spending a lot of time going back and forth to court when we could condense that. So I basically consolidated the two courts from the outside eye. Inside, we're still running two separate 
you know, dockets, two separate uh, cashiering systems, two separate budgets. But for the people that we serve, for the lawyers that we serve, for the litigants, as far as they know, we're one court. They can come in on any day and address all of the cases that they have on that day, you know, for judicial economy, you know, um, to save money, to save time. And, you know, that was something that I would kind of harass the trial court over saying, you know, we've got two of this and two of that, and there's a more efficient way to. So I think, you know, that is one way where I, I think I help. That's great. Uh, now, um, um, I was amazed in the years that I've been here that you had so much, so much responsibility. So we talked about it. You, I listened, you told me about it. Now, so would you tell uh, the council about all the responsibilities that you had in your position? In the yeah, and 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 assistant and and clerk. Because I never, I I I have been here and I've listened and I never heard so many uh, that you had so many responsibilities. In terms to of do. being a yeah. clerk magistrate yeah. in the district court. Yeah. Well, a, a clerk magistrate, you know, basically wears two hats. You have the administrative hat where you are, you know, responsible for your staff, you know, the hiring and managing of the staff and, you know, ultimately the records. And then also your, you know, quasi judicial duties where you're, you are approving criminal complaints every day. You're issuing search warrants. You are conducting show cause hearings, conducting um, small claim trials. In my instance, when I was first appointed to Gardner and the Winchenden District Court, sorry, um, the Winchenden District Court was located still in Winchenden. We had one first justice who traveled between the two courts. So on, unlike almost any other district court, there would be days where there would be no judge in the building, which is very unique to the gardner winchington um, district courts. So on those days, I basically conducted the judicial duties. I would arraign defendants, I would hold bail hearings, I would hold detention, yeah. probation detention hearings. And so I had a lot of experience that I think many other clerk magistrates don't have the opportunity to, to get because of the setup. You know, that changed once the Winchington court moved in. That was some period of year. So it gave me a unique opportunity to really hone my skills in those areas. So um, um, tell us about some of the, you, the hearings. You had uh, probation, detention hearings, uh, bail hearings, uh, criminal pretrial uh, conferences. And um, you've had show cause hearings, talking about rape, murder, kidnapping, drug trafficking. Tell us um, how you conducted all of those functions. Well, I, I think to me, one of the most important roles of a magistrate is the show cause hearings. You know, um, it's at that point where the clerk magistrate is really the gatekeeper in terms of what cases flow into the system and what cases are, are diverted. And I think that's where I draw my most satisfaction from conducting those hearings. So many times you have individuals who come before you in the show cause hearings who don't have criminal records, who have made a mistake. And I have the opportunity to look them in the eye, to hear the facts of the case, hear from the police departments, and make a decision whether or not to find probable cause and push that case forward, which then puts them in the system. And many times I don't think that that is a just result. And I've chosen a different path. You know, I've held it. I've imposed conditions, um, hopefully for the benefit of that defendant to correct whatever may have, you know, pushed them in you know, into getting involved with the court system. Um, and, and in fact, giving them a second chance, a second bite at the apple so they can maintain their record, they can go forward with their life without having to disclose on a college application, on a job application that they have a criminal record. And I do think everybody deserves that chance. And that's where the district court is so important. It gives you the people well, the opportunity. Well, I have to tell you, I don't know, I don't know if, they all would have the compassion you have to do that because I know someone that's in that position that all his life that's followed him, a fight on a yard with someone 
and and that you know I thank you for that. That's wonderful. You've helped a lot of people. I think I take yeah. the most pleasure in that. Yeah. So, um, tell me what what was the most serious that you had with the murder or rape? Well, in, in Gardner, a couple of years ago, um, we had a very vicious murder, um, and it was drug related, and you know, the state police were obviously involved, and the and the Gardner PD, and I was involved in. Uh, issuing multiple search warrants for that case and then ultimately issuing the criminal complaint for that case. You know, it was ultimately transferred out to the Superior Court, but many times all of these matters are initiated in the district court and where they're, you know, when the cases search warrant for, for those cases. Well, I have to tell you, um, and I even wrote it down because I never got so many adjectives in my life from anyone um, favorable to you. <laughs> and um, I got a call from Ian Colicchio, who is a clerk magistrate, and you have worked with her. You have covered for each other and all through the years, and you've known each other maybe 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. And she said that you are intelligent, you are gracious, you are I can you I consider it your kind. Well, we shut the door. Get the get the noise level down. Um, I'll go on kind, intelligent, well-rounded, professional, um, compassionate, and she said. And she is just the person I would like to see as a judge in my court. Can't get better than that. <laughs> Man's a lovely but, person. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I want to ask you some questions, philosophy. Okay. All right. Did you vote on the marijuana question? How'd you vote on that? That was a few years back. Um, I think I voted yes on the marijuana question. How do you feel about it now? I think I, I feel comfortable with that decision. Well, we're having a lot of problems in little towns. Um, I can't remember the town, little town, and uh, they voted yes. And so um, it's a very rural area, and they had this huge blueberry area. I'll call it blueberry patch because I'm not there. And so the citizens there wanted to take back that vote because they were going to turn it into a marijuana area. And they can't. No, no town or city can change that because if your community voted yes, that's it. You know zoning planning board no one can change it so that's what we have i'm in four square miles and we have three in three so I, I guess it's a yes or no whatever position you have on that so um i guess that you know i i do have an opinion because i have two friends whose sons died of overdose of heroin and they started on marijuana that doesn't mean everybody does there's people that enjoy it every day and They'll never go any further, but I guess it's just your own experience, you know? Um, so uh, what's your opinion um, about increasing the age of the juvenile court? You mean in terms of between juvenile and say district or superior court, raising the age? I I'm in favor of that. And you are. There's a lot of science that says people's brain not, not till they're 25. Right. And, so and I had four children before I was 25. And my brain was very formed. Okay. I really hate hearing that. You know, can't go by a book. Okay. Um, I went to college very late with four children. And I was in a child psychology class. I never brought this up before. And I was young. The teacher was probably the same age as I was, a young woman. She said that mothers talk more to infant girls than infant boys. And I raised my hand, the worst mistake I ever made. And I said, I have two boys and two girls. 
They, they had no sex. I talked their ears off when they were babies. She got me after class. She didn't want me in my class anymore. So she gave me another chance. I never commented again. And it was the hardest class I ever had because I had to try to throw out all my life experience and give her what she had in her book. So I disagree. We just had a 21 year old, 21 year old that killed 10 people, eight people. Should we blame it that his brain is not fully formed? I'm gonna get off my uh, off this, okay? Cause I'm very opinionated and I shouldn't be and I appreciate your opinion. Okay, so um, tell me, what was the most serious case that you've had? It, probably the murder case, probably a rape case. Um, I think the thing that I am so upset about, and we see it day after day after day, that mothers and their boyfriends are torturing and killing their children. Does that come before you? Do you had any of those? Well, we certainly have had our share of domestic violence cases. We sure, certainly have had our share of cases where children, you know, were victims of abuse. Absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, the, it, it seems like um, the criminals are getting younger. And uh, we saw just a couple of years ago, a 15 year old uh, raped and murdered his teacher. I mean, this is why, you know, um, really have to look at these Laws. What, what do you think about, um, what's your opinion about uh, minimum mandatory sentencing? I personally, I'm not in favor of min yeah. minimum mandatory sentencing. Well, I think that, I think the judges should have discretion. I think that's what that whole thing is about. So, um, okay, we, we talked for four hours and we even got into, and I don't know how far afield we got this. I had never talked about it before. But I mentioned to you that I'm concerned that we see a lot of animal abuse. And when you read about the torture that they've done to the animal, it's a one day story. You never hear what the sentence was. And I don't think it's very much either. Now, um, I told you this story and I'm gonna share it with my counselors. Um, Judge Michael Pomerol, when he came before us years and years ago, counselors, well, only Paul's here, he was not here, <laughs> we're the only, uh, he, um, when he was a lawyer, when he was a practicing lawyer, he was the only person in my whole tenure that got an award from the Animal Rescue League. I don't know why we talked about it. And I said, that meant a lot to me. And uh, the Animal Rescue League, and they kept it a surprise, they had, a, they had an auditorium built to give him an award for the cases that he has brought against animal abuse. Now I want you to tell me, and I was devastated, but I want you to say it again publicly about your experience with the, um, with the torture of a and murder of bears, B E A R S. We did have a case that involved um, some hunters who were baiting bears, which, if you're not familiar with that, they place food out for, and they had a, a tree stand and shot the bear and killed the bear, and baiting bears is illegal. And the environmental police came to me looking for a search warrant because they were trying to track down the bear carcass so they can bring and make their case against these these hunters and so i had never had experience with that but they these people after shooting the bear were bringing it to a taxidermist so they could have it stuffed and so they had the entrails from where the bear was slaughtered in the in the woods and they wanted to match that dna with the carc <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> which <clears throat> you should have some water um they wanted to try and match with dna the entrails that were left behind with the car you know the carcass of the bear that was sent out for taxidermy 
So, I mean, it was a horrible, horrible crime, you know, and the bear was just you know, obviously looking for food. But <clears throat> I don't know, I think I may have been the first and only person in the, in Massachusetts to issue a, you know, a search warrant for a bear carcass. And they were, in fact, able to obtain the bear carcass, match the DNA, and charge the individuals. Imagine no that uh, you know that was that's a first I uh, you know but um, no um, I think you know animals should be protected so um, so uh, now really your training for all the things that you have been responsible for and, and you didn't really go into all of them that we did when we met but I was surprised that you had to oversee all of those things do you, do you want do you want to go into that or, or what you have, um, you know, you are, and you've been a, um, on our chair of so many things and, and members. And um, so I think that, you know, your experience um, in actually substituting for judges you have in, in times that I think that brings a lot. So I am, um, you know, you know, I could go on and ask you questions. I think, well, oh, let me just ask you this. What was the most rewarding result that you've had in anything that's come before you? I would have to say one of the most rewarding cases that I was involved in was a show cause hearing where a young lady came in and she was charged with drug possession. And as I was conducting the show cause hearing, she was there with her grandmother and I was going through the facts and I was, I was reading it. You know, I saw that there were other individuals with her in the car and they were people who I known, have known as, um, you know, drug dealers and drug users. And I saw this young girl had no criminal history. But she looked a mess. Um, she was scared. And, you know, being a mother and being someone who has had so many hours and, and years of experience, you know, my gut instinct was that she was caught up in a circumstance, you know, that this really wasn't who she was. And so I worked closely with my chief of probation and I asked her, you know, some questions and whether she would be willing, you know, to take some steps to turn things around and I would hold the criminal case in abeyance. And she agreed to that. And so we did some drug testing um, thank you so much. And got her some other support. And I continued the case for a while. And she came back to me with her grandmother. And they were so happy and so grateful. She had turned her life around. She didn't get sucked into the, you know, the addiction cycle that, that could happen. And it's cases mm -hmm. like that and things like that that give me the most satisfaction of being able to look at people and, you know, see the good and give them a second chance and facilitate that happening. So times when I went home feeling really good. You know, um, I had brought it up to this administration. Um, I'm very concerned about with the pandemic that we don't know the child abuse and the domestic violence that's happening and it's happening. It's an increase and it's increasing. I've asked them if they would give a number. I haven't heard it lately. I'm hope they will give a number for people to call. We can't help the babies, but when children went to school every day, that child who was being abused, maybe would talk to the teacher. Maybe there would be some signs the teacher would see even physical. How can we have, which I, I have a lot of objections about their work, the children's agency, how can we have them get more involved to see in our society these people following up? They have closed the books on people like, you know, um, that have been torturing a child and we end up finding it in a bag in the river. Um, seven year old boy who has been stabbed and is the weight of a year old and they close the books and that's the end of it. What can we do about that? That they follow up. These children are being protected in this pandemic times and I'm really, really concerned about that. Well, I, I think that's a huge concern and, and I share that concern with you. 
Um, I know in the district court, you know, it's our practice. If well, we're hearing a case and we have a restraining order or somewhere where we become aware that there may be a child at risk or a child who's being abused to file a 51A and to get the agency involved and try and get that child some help and, and get that family some, some aid. But it is, as you're right, it's a huge problem, an overwhelming problem. I think in terms of my role as in the district court, I would try to be very aware of that and get the agencies that can help that family involved. Good. Okay, now you worked in Superior Court and District Court. Um, I know from people who have, are in the District Court what they say, and I almost anticipate that you're going to say the same thing. Tell me the difference of being the Superior in the District Court and your personal feeling. About it. Well, I think when I went to the District Court, I knew I had found my home. I love the Superior Court. It's a, it was a wonderful place to work, but it's a much more sterile environment. You know, most people are represented by attorneys. The issues that they're, you know, they're dealing with are somewhat removed. Not always, obviously, especially on the criminal side, but for the most part, where as the district court, I think Chief Justice Connolly used to always say this, and I agree, you know, the district court is where the rubber meets the road, right? I mean, this is the nitty gritty. And, you know, when I was in Cambridge, um, I would go upstairs to the Cambridge District Court, which is a couple floors above me, and I would just see those hallways packed and bustling with people, whereas in the Superior Court, kind of empty hallways, you know, we had 24 courtrooms running, a lot of space, and the District Court people were shoulder to shoulder, and they'd come there asking the court to help them with a myriad of issues, you know, and that, I think, was the impetus for me to apply for a clerk magistrate's position because I wanted to, you know, get into the nitty gritty and be involved with the community and being, you know, able to help individuals resolve whatever issues they had. And they come to the district court with all kinds of issues. People think the court has an answer to everything. We don't always, but I try to make sure that anybody who walks into my court goes out with some piece of information. If we couldn't resolve the issue, I try to point them to the, to the court or the agency that can or the phone number for, you know, the Bar Advocates Program. Give them something that can help them, you know, because that's what they came to the court for, looking for help, and I think that's our duty. Right. Well, in my experience here talking to, uh, to judges, they all say the same thing. The district court is the people's court. And they would never want to be elevated to any other court. They love what they do. And um, I have seen clerk magistrates who have given, and I'm sure you know, money to people to take a bus home or give them a lunch. Those are, that's what I have experienced here. And I just want to say, I think the saddest thing I have in my position being here this time, that there's so many wonderful people, judges, who have reached 70 and retired. And one of them is one of the judges you're replacing, Judge Kella Joan. What a wonderful person. He is the people's court. So, um, you know, I'm sure he must be very pleased to see you moving up to that position. I so, so. Um, I, I, you know, I, I enjoyed the all the time that we spent and um, and I, and personally, I always wanted twins. I never had them, so I, I'm jealous. <laughs> so anyway, um, I wish you all good luck. I mean, um, everyone has said so many good things about you. And I, as I said, I wrote down Ann Calicchio's, um all her comments, but that means a lot because that's not public. That's your personal. And I can't separate your personal from the public and it's excellent and I'm, I'm so pleased that you have got through this time and that you will be serving in the district court. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Devaney. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor Devaney. Councilor Kennedy. Um, when you were in Middlesex Superior Court, did you primarily sit in civil sessions? Um, I did a little bit of both, and a good majority of my time was trying to juggle the 24 sessions and keep them up and running at the same time. I remember I was <laughs> floating around the first session back in those days when you were sending them out everywhere in the world. Um, the judges there, I think, were that time were Judge Grobo and Judge Zobel. And yes. 
various judges. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was there. But uh, yeah, did, did you do it? I'm, I'm just curious about your civil background. You had a little bit when you were in Malden, um, my next door neighbor from Everett, and a little bit in Newburyport, it looks like. But how much did you actually do sitting in the, in the Superior Court? I, I would spend, you know, I would say probably equal time in both the criminal and, and the civil. And um, the, um, and in Gardner, do you, I assume like every other court, there are more civil filings than there are criminal violence is that fair to say yes okay and do you actually do civil trials there you ever get to any of them we do actually okay um, and we actually had one on zoom which was very very difficult but we have one had had one during the pandemic what kind of case was that um i think it was an an insurance case okay yeah you know uh, civil trials the, my experiences with judges especially district court judges is they try to run away from them do you think that's true well not in Gardner. Well, maybe we don't not, run away from anything in but Gardner. in general do you think they run away from uh, civil cases most of them want to do criminally they don't like to get tied up to civil cases because it involves a lot more writing and a lot of uh rulings and findings and things of that nature well i wouldn't disagree with that assessment of it but i think in gardner i've been fortunate enough to have judges who i think have you know taken on the civil as well as the criminal but yes the criminal is a little bit more flashy a little more glamorous okay. um well we we have we, we know we have more civil filings than we do criminal filings in gardner because you already said that uh how many um criminal trials would you say you do in a year and how many civil trials would you say you do in a year well, I couldn't give you the exact number, but I yes. would say we do far more criminal trials than civil right. trials. Even though there were a lot more civil filings. Yes. But I also think, you know, similarly to criminal, I mean, a lot of things were resolved before the trial sure. date. So yeah, I, think no, I understand, but insurance companies tend not to give up their money in civil cases until it, they're on the courthouse steps. And even then it, it's a struggle. That's true. That's true. Um, do you think, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about implicit bias in the court system uh both in terms of you know in terms of all kinds of issues that come people that come before the court do you think that that exists i do and do you think um an african-american male going into a district court is more likely to get a harsher sentence because of that implicit bias than say someone who looks like me <coughs> yeah i would <coughs> hate to you know i hate to think that but i think that History has shown us that that's probably that's true. true. It is. Yes. True. We, 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 we now recognize it's true. The question is what we're doing to try to fix it. I have to be honest. I don't think we're doing enough yet. I agree. We're on the way, but we're not near enough. And um, that applies to all kinds of implicit prejudices that, that are built into the system. I, I don't know of a single judge uh, that, that I've seen has an explicit bias. Uh, if they did, they shouldn't be sitting. Uh, but it's, it's human nature. Uh, what about insurance companies? You, you, you talked about uh, that insurance case that was there. Do you think insurance companies tend to pay less to people of color in terms of personal injury type cases and other cases than they do Caucasians? Do you think the settlements are less, the judgments are less? Honestly, I don't know. I mean, you think there's an implicit bias in that side of the system? Well, I think we're learning that there's implicit bias everywhere. You know, and that's part of the part of the problem is finding trying to recognize and, and educate ourselves. So if I were to apply that, you know, that I would say, yeah, that that's probably true. I don't know it for a fact, but I think there's definitely a possibility. How are you going to be able to handle civil cases? Do you, do you think you're up to speed on those? I mean, the criminal side, in one sense, is easier. There's no question about it. It's easy to learn. It's easy to do. You've sat in a lot of criminal sessions. The types of cases you're going to do, driving unders, domestics, um, assault and batteries, uh, drug cases, you've seen a thousand times sitting in the court. You've seen judges handle them. Um, what if somebody comes in with a uh, complicated contract case? Well, I, I think I'd be able to handle it. And I think, you know, also I have the ability to know what's coming up before me and educate myself in any way, you know, before the trial. I mean, it's not like I would, it would be a surprise or it shouldn't be a surprise. If, if I'm doing my job, I'm going to know what's coming up on that court docket and I'm going to educate myself in any way that I feel that I may um, be lacking. But, you know, I think I've had experience on, on both sides. Right. So 
you know, that cuts both ways. I, I, I admire judges when I go in, especially in Superior Court, where there's a motion for summary judgment on or some type of complicated uh, motion before the judge or even a pretrial, and they come out for a pretrial hearing on it, and they've read all the materials. It can be pretty hefty, as you know. Um, uh, but I don't want them doing that in a criminal case because I don't want them prejudging it. I don't want a judge reading a police. I, I've gone in the courts many times in district courts, and the judge has already read the police report before we start a trial. And uh, it, it it prejudices them before they start. Have you seen that? Judges no, I don't. I don't actually. I don't recall really my judges going through the criminal stuff. Before I've seen it a lot, but they've read it ahead of time. They've even commented on it ahead of time. I read the police report. Well, if the police report was all there was to it, we wouldn't have a thing called a trial, right? <laughs> That's true. You know? That's true. Um, uh, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, we've had discussions about your judgeship going back to your first application when I was first introduced to you in uh, Gardner Court. I do remember you from the Superior Court. I think you were on one... Uh, Superior Court trial I might have had with Judge Zobel one time, a criminal case way back in the 90s or something. But um, I think you're going to be a terrific judge. I, I mean, I'm really pleased by your nominee. Casting a yes vote next week. Thank you, Councilor Kane. I really appreciate that very much. And I have to mention the, the calls I got, especially Leo Farmer, who was all over me. He was my good friend in, a, in your law school classmate. Great guy. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Now we'll go through the councillors who are remote. I'll go district order. So, Councillor Ferreira, would you like to ask any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, the nominee and I had uh, substantial conversations over the last week or so, and uh, I was really delighted with the qualifications and her demeanor. I spoke to a lot of people. Um, and, uh, I, you know, there's just one question that comes to mind, and I hope you don't mind me asking this, but um, <clears throat> I know you're a collegiate basketball player and got a free ride. And uh, I also heard that you often went to uh, Buffalo Wild Wings after <laughs> court sometimes, and you took advantage of defense lawyers in basketball shootouts. Now, Councilor Kennedy claims to have had a college basketball career, too. And I just want to know if you took advantage of him at Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> I did not, um, and I would not until he casts his vote next week. But after that, I think it's, he's fair game. Okay, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ionella. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me there? I can. I just have one question as well. Uh, when you spoke uh, with uh, Councillor Juvenville, you know, on the issue of jury trials. And you talked about as long as the environment was safe, you would have no problem with resuming jury trials. Let's assume a jury trial is scheduled, let's say, I don't know, June 20th. I assume that's during the week. Or, and one of the participants, uh, whether it's the defense attorney, whether it's uh, the plaintiff's attorney, let's say it's a civil case, or uh the witnesses i don't feel comfortable what are you going to do at that point are you going to well, you're going to grant a continuance that's my point sorry well i guess i would have to explore it beyond that i don't feel comfortable you know and well, drill down well, let's, just, let's explore it. what do you mean by that we can explore it now make believe i'm one of the people who say i don't feel comfortable well, I guess I would inquire why they didn't feel comfortable. Well, I, 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 I haven't had, the, I, I unfortunately haven't had the vaccine yet. We'll make it real easy. <laughs> and, and and what party is this person? Is a juror? You said? No, it's it's it's, it's either defense attorney, uh, if it's a criminal case, it's the prosecutor, or if it's a personal injury case, it's the. Uh, it's the personal injury attorney. We'll go that way first. Oh, we can keep going down the line. It's, 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 it, well, let's do that part. Those are the uh, attorneys in the case. Well, I, I think, again, I would have to evaluate the environment that we're in. If there were precautions that, you know, the CDC and the state feels make the environment safe. Um, and 
have a further, you know, discussion with the parties and see what their feelings were in terms of continuing the matter and what impact that may have on the parties. I think one well, thing COVID. That's actually troubling to me. I'm, I've been vaccinated, but let's assume I haven't been. I, I don't feel comfortable. I'm really nervous about it. Uh, I don't want to participate. I mean, you may say six feet, but there have been people who are seven, eight feet apart that have gotten uh, COVID. So I just do not feel comfortable. It, it's going to stress me out. I don't think I can do an effective job. That's not good enough for you. Well, I think with what you've just added, when I said I would explore with them why, you know, all of those factors need to be taken into consideration. And kind of hearkening back with the conversation I had with Councillor Dubinville is that, you know, we have to make sure that we're delivering justice. We're not just getting the job done. And I think one thing COVID has taught us is that we need to be able to be flexible. And we're actually taking a much broader look, you know, at all the facets now of jury trial and the court system, which I think we wouldn't have but for the pandemic. So yes, if someone's before me saying they don't feel comfortable, they can't perform their job and that's gonna have, you know, an impact on all the other parties, yeah, then I think that I, I may need to continue that case. But it wouldn't be an automatic continuance. Well, I think just on the blanket statement, I don't feel comfortable. Probably not. I think like I said, I think I would have to hear more and understand why. Yeah, so yeah that's I, actually I troubling. I that's actually troubling to me. And I'm here right now. I'm not going anywhere. Like, what more would you want to find out? In other words, well, I like, just said, I like it's, I don't feel comfortable. I, I'm nervous of getting COVID. That's, that's the right. situation. Yes, that's when you initially said, I don't feel comfortable, I said, I would want to then ask why. And then you expanded and said, I, you know, I don't think I can do my job. I'm afraid of getting COVID. And that would be the type of information that I was looking for. You know, what was the reason for the discomfort? And would that be a, a reason to automatically continue the case? Well, I, I guess I, I wouldn't say automatically. Yes, that would be a reason that I would consider continuing the case. Okay, I don't want to give you a hard time, but That's a okay. lot of lawyers have asked me this question, and I'm not getting the. You're basically saying, "Yeah, I'd consider it." Well, I'll consider it, but you can easily come back after considering and say, "Yeah, we got to move cases, or we have to do whatever." And the uh, your motion to continue the case because you're afraid of getting COVID is not good enough. I mean, you're not. I mean, we've asked other people, and we get different answers from different prospective nominees. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, everyone's different. I know who pe people want to go to a restaurant. Some people, even if there's 10 feet uh, of social distancing, they don't want to go. And we know the CDC guidelines. They don't want to go. But if someone says, you know what, I don't, I don't want to go. I don't. I just feel awful. I haven't gone to a restaurant. I haven't gone anywhere. I don't even go grocery shopping. And now I got to do a jury trial. Because Judge so and so says, uh, you know, the CDC guidelines. I haven't gone on a plane. I haven't done anything. But I'm getting the impression for me, you'll consider it. But under what I just said, that's not an automatic reason to have the case continued. All right. Well, I can tell you, Counselor, from my actual experience during this pandemic, I have several attorneys who have not come into the courtroom at all because they don't feel comfortable. And I have made every consideration and I've handled their cases and kept their cases on track, be, whether it be via Zoom or a telephone conference or a polycom conference um, so that I could work with them and they could feel comfortable you know, in the environment there. So in a practical sense, um, I have done just that uh, for there's probably two or three attorneys who are regularly in my court who don't feel safe coming in, even though we have the plexiglass and even though we have a limited number of staff. So I guess what I was listening to when you were asking me is being very conscious of when you use the word automatic. I mean, I think I, I don't want to be one of those people who automatically does anything. I want to understand what people's concerns are and I will respect that and I want to make an informed decision about that. So I think maybe I was being tripped up a little bit by the word automatic. 
Um, and then soon as you expanded and said, well, here's why I, I don't want to go forward. I don't feel comfortable. I don't want to get COVID. You know, that has an impact on, on justice. And I think that that would be a reason for a continuance. But in the practical sense, I have been very flexible and believe people um, deserve flexibility in terms of their concerns around this pandemic. Thank you. I Thank should you. have used the term more likely than not. <laughs> well, I, I think that was me just trying to really listen and and dissect the words, but I. Yeah, that was my fault. Uh, uh, I assume if I use that word that maybe you'd be more amenable to a continuance if I use the words more likely than not. Yes, counsel, I would. Uh, yeah, other than that, that was a concern I have because lawyers, you know, even what you just said, you know, you've been flexible. Uh, or you would be flexible, but they really haven't had jury trials, or if they just maybe just started. But you know, motions—that's a different scenario. Uh, jury trials is a total new game. I mean, that's—and uh, I understand. I mean, there's there's so many criminal cases that are way way behind. We the, the backlog is really substantial. But again, I think you have to consider uh, all the factors. And I know you said you would. But there's a lot of attorneys out there uh, that don't feel whatever the word is uh, doing a jury trial. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I know people who won't go to a restaurant, indoor restaurant. Are you kidding me? They just won't do it. And you you know you know the CDC guidelines. You know there's they got the plexiglass, they have the social distancing, the certain amount of capacity, just like you'd have a jury trial. They just don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. Uh, so I just hope that you'll uh, think of that when somebody comes before you about a continuance. And everybody's different. Everybody's different. Maybe the first five people are totally feel at ease doing a jury trial. But maybe that other person, for whatever reason, maybe that other person has a story where a family member died of COVID. I don't know. But I hope you'll really uh, be cognizant of that fact that if someone comes before them, you'll be sensitive to that, and uh, hopefully, uh, you'll uh, grant them a continuance if that ever happens. Thank you, Counselor. I don't have any other questions. I think uh, I think you're going to be a great addition to the court. Uh, and when it comes, your nomination comes before us next week. I want you to know that I'd be more than happy to support you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ionella. Councillor Hurley. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Morning, Councillor. Uh, we talked last week, and um, I'm j I just got a few questions, but uh, one of your biggest fans is Councillor Kennedy, who from day one said that you, you were great. So, um, you've been a clerk for a long time. What is your philosophy on bail? Well, I mean, I think the presumption is that everyone should be released on their personal recognizance. That's where we start. And I think the the recent SJC cases, you know, talking about how we need to take everyone's personal financial situation into account is also very important because you know, $100 for one person might as well be a million dollars. And so I think that it's a very important part of the process and shouldn't be taken for granted. And I can tell you that so many people who have never needed to make that decision to set bail or to hold someone maybe don't realize what a huge undertaking that is to take away somebody's liberty to take away somebody's ability to go home to their family at the end of the day so i think that's something where i think the court needs to spend time and understand what the risks are to to that individual or to the public and make a very deliberate decision when they're setting bail what if they what had if a three, what if they had a three-page record for for drugs and guns. Well, again, I mean, I, you obviously have to take that into consideration. And when you 
you, you know, you need to look at the cases, you need to look at the age of the cases, you need to look at the disposition of the cases, you need to look at all of those, you know, those factors and whether they're going to be a risk to the community, whether there are less restrictive means to keep the community safe other than taking away their liberty. So, you know, I couldn't make a blanket statement, not knowing what the specifics of that were, but I don't think necessarily when you say three page record, that means, oh, you need bail or a 10 page record. It depends on what that consists of. Are they all motor vehicle offenses or are there offenses of violence? Are By, they, I oh, indicated it was drugs and guns. And guns, right. So again, on those um, cases which are more serious, especially the gun offenses, um, I would have to look carefully at whether or not this is a person who um, poses a, f a flight risk or a risk of harm and, and whether bail should be imposed. But not knowing the specifics of those, I don't know, but I think those charges would indicate a closer look. Um, uh, one of the things you haven't done yet is uh, sentencing. How would you go about determining what an appropriate sentence is, not for a first offender, not for a second offender, not for a third offender, but for someone who um, has a um, really serious drug problem that's evident from a four-page record or a five-page record that consists of drug possession as well as um, Larceny is under. Um, usually it involves um, cases where they tried to steal from, you know, the, the big box stores or whatever to, to get money for drugs. Um, and the argument is that this person shouldn't go to jail because they're a mother. So, I'm sorry, the last part is you're saying the argument is this person should not go to jail because they're a mother? Correct. Correct. Well, again, I think this is where I say that I, you know, I'm not in favor of mandatory, man, um, mandatory sentences. I think when you're sentencing someone, the more discretion and the more flexibility a judge has, I think the better outcome. I mean, we want to deter um, we want to rehabilitate um, and we want to give support. And sometimes we, you know, we need to punish. I mean, that's part of the judicial system and that sometimes is the answer. Um, but I don't think it should be our first answer, our go-to answer. When you see someone who has a record that's got the drug offenses, many times you will see those additional larcenies and things of that nature because that's all part and parcel of addiction many times. I don't think taking people who have an addiction issue and locking them up is the most effective way. It doesn't address the underlying problem. It doesn't help them, you know, rehabil necessarily rehabilitate um, themselves. So I think having the discretion at sentencing, and this is one of the reasons why I have applied for this position because as a clerk magistrate, you know, I'm doing the show cause hearings, I'm issuing the criminal complaints, I'm signing off on the complaints when they come in from the police departments, but I don't get to do that end part. And I think sometimes that's where you have the biggest impact on someone's life. And I want the ability to see the case through to the end, to try to work with the probation department and impose some conditions and some support systems where I can, someone can turn their life around, where I can feel that satisfaction of saying, okay, I've safeguarded the community, but I've also helped this individual start a new life. And that's where I think the important work of judges come in. Ultimately, sometimes there is no other answer. Sometimes you've gone down all of those roads and you know, you'll know you see on their record, they've served 30 day sentences, 60 day sentences and nothing's worked. And ultimately incarceration is the answer. But I think that would be the last quiver that I, you know, that I drew. I mean, I think we have a lot of tools, not as many as we should have, but there are tools available to judges in the district court that I should, I think should be used to under, 
to um, resolve the systemic problem that you may identify as, as the driving force, you know, with that person's involvement with the court. All right, thank you. Thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you, Councillor Hurley. Um, I just have one question I'm going to drive a point on, but first I just want to say that um, I think it's very impressive that you've been wearing the hats of Winchington and Gardner uh, clerk and that you've found uh, opportunity to look for efficiencies and to improve the way things function. Um, and I know that, you know, Toy Town and Chair City, like every other part of the state, have their own unique set of circumstances. I've lived in Templeton and obviously I'm honored to represent those two communities. And um, everyone I've spoken to who's crossed uh, paths with you has had positive things, um, positive things to say, and that sure, certainly goes a long way. I appreciate that um, there's been discussion today of access to justice, um, going whether it's, you know, hopefully what it will be the waning days of COVID, um, whether it's uh, taking into account uh, uh, mental illness that defendants in particular may have and making sure that they understand what's happening and are at ease in the courtroom. Um, <clears throat> So the thing I want to touch on is um, how you'll exercise your discretion relative to some of the things that have been been talked about. You and I had a conversation um, about show cause hearings. I won't ask about that again because it's been addressed, but um, the implicit bias and the things that were revealed in the so-called Harvard study on racial disparities, um, among other things, um, your discretion is where those systemic things hit the road. Right, and so I want to take it actually in the direction of something that uh, Councillor Devaney and I have a respectful disagreement on, which is um, juvenile jurisdiction and brain development in the early years. So, you know, first of all, we have people entering the district court um, who've, you know, already been through our juvenile system. It's kids who are in uh, our foster system. It's kids who are disadvantaged, uh, and in a lot of cases, it's black and brown. Uh, boys in particular. Um, and, you know, what I read from the science is that it's it's the male brains that tend to be developing slower um, or need more time into the 20s. Um, that doesn't excuse behavior. Uh, to me, though, it's a factor among the penumbra that you would hopefully consider um, when you're making decisions. Um, is that something that would factor into your decisions? And how does it kind of inform your view on your role as a district court judge? Well, that would absolutely factor into my decision, um, not only as a clerk magistrate, but as a mother, as a sister, as an aunt, as a you know, human being. I think, you know, I've had so much interaction with people and as a person growing up myself, I, I know that I may not make the same decision when I was 17 as, as when I was 19 or 21 or 25. And so many of my show cause hearings involve young people who have made impulsive poor decisions. And I don't think that is a basis where we should ruin people's lives for the rest of their lives. Again, you would have to carve out from that violence. You know, I know that uh, Councillor Devaney is concerned about that. And I don't lump someone, you know, a, a 15 year old who, you know, massacres or is. You know, in a school shooting as the same as the 15 or 17 year old who steals something from a drugstore, you know, or um, so I think you, it has to be based on the facts, but I think we have a, an opportunity in the district court with young people for, for rehabilitation. I mean, they have a long and hopefully productive life in front of them and we don't want to take that away for an impulsive Poor decision at such a young age. So, and I agree that your cognitive ability increases as you age and you make better decisions, and that has to be factored in when you're judged. Thank you. And, and I appreciate that not just as compassion, but pragmatism too, in terms of the goals of, of getting people back into society. Um, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness today. Um, uh, I think you did a great job. I think your background speaks well to your uh, uh, nomination to this role. Um, I'll happily uh, support you next week after putting your name forward uh, at the council assembly. Thank you okay. so much, Councillor DiPaolo. And with that, we close this hearing. Thank you. Thank you for your time.